guns. They're cool. They're fun toys. They're incredibly necessary tools of defense. And they're the sexy part of doing a lot of this community defense work. It's important to note, lots of folks who are gonna be involved in community defense are gonna be unarmed. We have to make sure we're accommodating for where everybody is. There's gonna be lots of folks who don't wanna pick up a gun, but even if you are going to pick up a gun, it's important if you're going to be considering yourself capable of fighting. One, you're going to get hit. That's what fights are. Nobody fights perfectly clean. Nobody spends uh, a lifetime involved in fights and gets away with no scars. Some of that we can mitigate with a variety of things, with OPSEC, with uh, armor. But sometimes if you're gonna be involved in community defense, there's a chance you might get winged by something. You might, God forbid, go up against a, an active shooter and be tagged. That's, that happens. Unfortunately, we're talking about people that want to kill us. You fighting back doesn't stop that. In addition to that, we're talking about a role in the community. I would argue that there are going to be multiple people who could do just as much good for their community by walking around with a med kit instead of a gun. I don't think everyone needs to be armed. If you're under direct threats, you absolutely should, but the focus should always be trying to help your community. That's always the goal. So we're gonna focus today on med kits. Now, the best way to learn how to use all, any of this stuff would be take a class. Um, this is not a replacement for something like a Stop the Bleed course. This is just a good general orientation on what some of this equipment does, how to use it in a, in a pinch, uh, and kind of also getting into why you're using it. Before we move on, I want to talk about today's sponsor, Lagoon Trading Company. They're an awesome company that sells Milserp while, amazingly enough, not being fascist garbage. Shocking. I know. Literally just go look at their pinned tweet and yes, yes, this is a company that we should be supporting. They aren't out here grifting for dollars. They aren't out here selling an inferior product while claiming to be lefty, they are straight up doing the good work. They understand how frankly fucking dangerous everything is right now, and they're genuinely working to help the community be prepared. They have a website, link is in the doobly-doo, um, and they do really awesome custom work in addition to their like ability to get a lot of the Milserp stuff that you can think of. Um, really excited to have them as a sponsor, and uh, we have some other videos planned in the future. I can't wait to show you some of the stuff that's coming up with them. So, med kits. You'll hear a lot of these terms tossed around, and to many who don't know, they might seem interchangeable. IFAC, AFAC, MFAC. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to a new one you probably haven't heard. These are actually minor variations, or at least different flavors, of the same concept. An IFAC stands for Individual First Aid Kit, and the idea is simple. It's the stuff an individual combatant needs in order to imagine you were knocked unconscious and there was some problem that had caused that. What tools would you want to have available to somebody else? The original IFACs were put on a soldier's back uh, because the, the expectation was somebody else would be working on you. It wasn't something you would need to grab. That said, it kind of has morphed into this thing that, like, it is an individual person's medical kit. Um, an AFAC is what happens when you take that and customize it due to advanced medical training. Uh, the difference between an IFAC and an AFAC is basically that you have taken the componentry of your IFAC and then added things that is specialized to you. This could be anything from surgical kit, specific drugs, um, specific filters or additional layers. This could be outdoor survival equipment. Um, this will vary wildly person to person and situation to situation. The thing that makes your AFAC unique is the thing you are adding based on your training and your qualifications. Most people who don't have advanced training will only be interacting with either an IFAC or an MFAC. Now, an MFAC is a 
multiple first aid kit. And the idea, again, is relatively simple. To make an MFAC, take three IFACs, and then pay an anime character to push them all together until they become one thing. Or just, like, buy the contents of an IFAC kit and do it three times and put it in a bag. There's one that's growing in popularity that I have seen popping up in a lot of different forms and named a couple different ways, so I'm gonna give it a specific name for this video. The PFAC. Excuse me one moment. This is a PFAC. Now this is sold as an ankle IFAC in most places where it's sold. It's also referred to as an ankle med kit. Um, there's a couple other versions of this as well. I've seen versions of this that can fit on a wrist or on a shoulder. I've seen uh, small bags um, that you can throw some medical supplies into. This is uh, something that I highly recommend as a personal option. Uh, it's not something that will rock, that you would be able to rock, use for every medical situation. Um, but it's small enough that you can carry it with you. These are designed to be small and minimalist. They're designed to be something that you can um, throw on and conceal. And where concealment needs to be a high priority, these allow you to bring some basic medical supplies with you. Now, stepping up from the PFAC, we have the IFAC, like this one you can get from Lagoon Trading. And importantly, a good IFAC is removable. This is designed to be set up in vehicles, in a variety of like emergent, like quick grab situations. You can tie this to a lot of things and just quickly either remove the, the knot or the worst case scenario, take out a knife and just cut the string and grab it. Um, but this is specifically designed to be able to just accommodate like a, uh, a go around a bar or attach to into any sort of like rigging kits um, attached to a belt, but specifically IFACs are designed to be ripped off. You have to remember when you are going to help somebody, you don't want to be running back and forth for supplies. You want to grab the whole thing, set it where the emergency is and unpack it in some place right next to it so that you have easy access, but also it's not going to be affected by the emergency itself. Dump pouches are great companions to these. A lot of the stuff that you're going to be interacting with is going to come in a sterile pouch. Um, a lot of the stuff you'll be dealing with will be single time use. Being able to throw any of that into a bag that can stay on a belt or stay attached to your rig, and then when you're not using it for that, can get folded up into a significantly smaller package useful little additional piece. Both of these are things that you can get from Lagoon Trading Co. And remember, what good woods protocol is we take out everything we bring in with us. That means any of your emergency supplies, even if you're throwing them on the ground quickly in order to handle things, immediately afterwards, pick that shit up. There's a few basic steps to any injury. The first is identify where the wound is. Now, for most uh, major wounds, where there's a lot of blood coming out and you can't specifically see the wound, this is where trauma shears come in. Because again, the first step is always figure out where the wound is. So a good solid sh set of shears that'll just straight up cut through clothing should be accessible near the top of any good kit. If somebody was shot, cut in three directions in a Y pattern away from where the bullet hole is and rip the fabric out of the way. Clothing can be replaced, people can't. Tourniquets, learn how to use them, learn how tight they're supposed to be, make sure you're applying them if there's ever uh, a bleeding that you can't stop, and importantly, um, don't buy shit. This is a perfect example of a brand not to get. I have this open so I can be demonstrating it. You'll notice the tourniquets that I actually run, uh, you keep in the plastic until you're going to use it. They're medically sealed. You may as well use that to your advantage. These you frequently find around Amazon. These break. These are well known to break. Even when they don't break, they frequently aren't made to the original specs. They're just made using vaguely similarly shaped components. These are notorious for snapping 
Um, they have a really bad tendency as you are just needing to get it tighter to suddenly go loose. And now the bleeding's off to the races. Now the absolute cheapest kind of tourniquet is one of these. It is a S-Mock tourniquet. And the thing with these is the good and bad side. They are cheap as fuck. If you need to be throwing in uh, a ninth and tenth round of backup for whatever reason, um, having a couple S mocks is better than nothing. I would not recommend using this if you have any other option. If you just want to throw it on your own arm, um, especially like having one as an emergency backup, it is frequently better than nothing. Uh, but it's worth pointing out that while it is better than nothing, you are ta inherently talking about an inferior tool. It's slower to apply. It's significantly slippier in an operation where there's going to be blood coming out. Tourniquets are for big bleeds, but you're also going to want a thing. You're also going to want things like gauze and bandages. Gauze plus pressure can slow a lot of bleeding. So one of the things you definitely want to be carrying on whatever form of kit you have is some bandages and some gauze. Now, the bandages are what are actually being applied to the wound, and the gauze is what is going to be holding down the bandages with pressure. Now, what I have here are some sealed gauze. For this type of thing, frankly, go cheap. As long as it's consistently sterile, I wouldn't worry about brand names. I wouldn't worry about uh, making sure it's made in America. As long as it's sterile, it's good. Different styles of gauze, including the rolls and quick remove sheets, are designed to do the same thing for different shapes of different wounds. If you've got some self-adhesive bandage, if you've got gauze and medical tape, or even just gauze and band-aids, you can jury rig a lot. Right alongside the tourniquet, there should be a Sharpie. Why? Because Sharpies allow you to write down the time that a tourniquet went on. A tourniquet has two hours before it's going to start doing damage to the person. We've all heard uh, that you can't cut off the blood flow to a limb and have it uh, not do damage. Long term, that's true. If you cut off blood flow to a limb, eventually you're going to cause necrosis. You're going to slowly kill off the limb. You have some time before that happens, though. This allows you to know how much time has passed on that tourniquet. That said, if you're throwing a tourniquet on somebody, the next step is either a hospital or a very competent doctor. The exam gloves allow you to maintain a barrier between you and the person you're working on. Now that is important for both of your sakes. You are working on somebody who you have not taken a detailed medical history of. You don't know their blood pathogen history. You don't know their, uh, you don't know if they happen to be carrying a bug from their cousin's kid from babysitting them last Tuesday. You don't know if they're gonna be covered in some weird disgusting material because they were just working somewhere like especially if you're planning on helping the community deal with these emergencies people come from all over the place to do weird things nobody's ever expecting to be attacked so people will be in weird states when they're getting attacked it's important to maintain a barrier both for your safety and for theirs you should also point out there's a good chance you're sick and you don't know it we should point out this is in the age of COVID, so there is always the chance that not only are you sick, you're passing on the next wave of a horrifyingly contagious disease. You don't want to be the thing that makes your patient worse. Ever. If you can, when you're working on somebody, a mask is always appropriate. This was this is not a political statement. This is not a whatever. It, Masks work. Masks have been effective from before the pandemic. They will continue They will continue being effective during the pandemic. They are now effective. For both of your sakes, if you can wear a mask, it helps. One of these is better than nothing, but if you can get uh, N95 or better, you absolutely should. Next up, we have something called hemostatic granules. Hemostatic granules are what the word says. Hemostatic, stopping blood. 
The idea behind hemostatic granules is relatively simple. You can pour them on some kind of graze or open but not internally bleeding wound, like say a, 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 a surface level abrasion, um, certain burns, um, say a ricochet fling hits a rock and then bounces back and hits somebody while you're out target shooting and they're lucky and it grazes an arm. Um, there is a chance hemostatic granules might be the end of that problem, depending on how bad the bleeding is. Now, depending on where they're hitting the arm, if there is a lot of blood, um, I keep them as an emergency thing. Because if I am seeing uh, a, an odd-shaped wound and we're about to move them and I want to pack the, the wound closed before we try and move them to an emergency setting, they can be better than nothing. It's worth pointing out, if you stop the bleeding externally but don't call, fix the cause of the problem you can cause internal bleeding um and that can have wild consequences for uh recovery efforts so it is useful for some stuff but you got to make sure when you're using it it's not something that would gush forever if you're looking at something and you're like oh that's not it's not bleeding heavily but it's open and it's i'm worried about this getting infected hemostatic granules can stop something from getting in by helping it seal itself. Uh, if you are seeing a lot of gut flow, blah, if you are seeing a lot of blood flowing from something, tourniquet's probably your better bet. Um, hemostatic granules have some argument for areas where you can't throw a tourniquet, can't throw a tourniquet on the neck. If you can hold the hemostatic granules on where the wound is though, you might be able to hold them together enough to get them to the hospital or to an emergency setting. Chest seals. Chest seals are something that if you are putting together a med kit, you absolutely need to have chest seals in your med kit. These things are vital. I have vented ones right here. Now, there is something known in the EMS space uh, as a sucking chest wound or an SCW. And essentially what that means is blood is getting into the lungs and slowly collapsing the lung every time you are breathing out more of the space for where the lung should be is being filled by blood and you're slowly but surely losing the ability to breathe in order to prevent the air coming in through the wound you want a chest seal because the chest seal is something you can slap on the wound and you can make sure that no more air is going to get in there and filling up the lung cavity and preventing you from taking a deep breath. And importantly, the vented version, the one that I have here, and the one that I highly recommend, just have a bunch of these. Because the difference is a non-vented chest seal will allow the, uh, the air to prevent, uh, it creates a barrier both, both ways. The air that has gotten in is staying in and the air that has gotten out is staying out that air is going to bring with it microbes and shit and your lung you're going to have a massive lung infection sorry our bodies are all, aren't designed to like randomly interact with microbes we have filters for a reason and then on top of that you still have the partial problem of you can only kind of breathe because you haven't been able to remove the air that was causing the problem in the first place a vented chest seal will allow that air to be pushed out slowly which can really aid in recovery efforts so, vented chest seals, fucking get them. Some people choose to keep water with their med kits. Um, if I'm not bringing out my own water, I will throw in some kind of sterile water attachment. Um, the important thing that you are using water for in this instance is not, um, you're not, you're not focused on dehydration. The main focus for that water is pushing blood out of the way in a voluminous space. And an easy trick for using that is take a knife and stab a few holes into the top of a plastic water bottle. You now have a water sprayer. You can turn that upside down and squeeze on the bottle and it will let you use it like a mini hose and wash off uh, access to whatever wound site you need access to. And then we have super glue. Ah, nope. I see what you did there. You started going for the normal household stuff. Yeah, I get it. It's great for holding the footboard on when you um, when, when you masturbate too enthusiastically. But for human beings, while yes, technically you can use the cheap stuff you'll find at Home Depot, 
there are a lot of complicated reactions to that being used because you're injecting something from a non-hermetically sealed factory setting into an open wound. <laughs> um, there's multiple levels of not great in there. That said, they make medical grade super glue and medical grade super glue Definitely always keep this in a kit. This is something that you are going to want to have on you because this will allow you to spot fill in a, uh, a thing that has come open and allow you to plug holes in a way that you really wouldn't expect to work in a lot of cases. As long as there isn't like a mass of blood coming from the area, frequently, yeah, you can just dab some super glue on it and keep going. Triangular bandages are one of those things that you're not going to be using this directly on wounds in a lot of cases. You'll be using this to attach bandages. Oh, you'll have like a bandage structure. This will be like a reinforcement structure. Uh, if somebody breaks an arm, you can use this to create a makeshift sling pretty quickly. Um, you can also end up using these in a lot of cases uh, if you have a, a complex press that you need to be keeping on. This is a great final layer for locking it down. Um, quick clot bandages are something that um, I have a complicated relationship with because on the one hand, I understand where they could in theory be useful. I'm actually gonna make this the transitional point then because quick clot, to me, that's an AFAC thing. There are specific circumstances where a quick clock bandage makes sense. And in those dire emergencies, you will be glad that you threw the quick clot on there. Your doctors won't. And here's why. Quick clot is really great at getting into a wound and sealing it. Quick clot then needs to be removed. And the problem with that is it has gotten into the wound and sealed itself into your body. So frequently removing quick clot re-traumatizes the area in a way that folks in the ER can be a bit scared of. Lots of people who deal with like the, the, the EMS and recovery side will see quick clot wounds as like, oh, these have been patched up. Um, amazingly considering what they said the damage was but the surgeon later on is having to cut away a lot of the bandage that you in a way that you wouldn't have to with other bandages um so if it's not needed it's not the kind of thing that you should deploy and this is more where it shifts from the ifac to the afac range because you really need to know when it's necessary and when it's just going to be burdensome down the line everybody's going to be using different tools to generate their afac in my personal case, I happen to use a, uh, a suture kit. Um, I have taken a couple of courses in uh, applying sutures that said, um, this is the kind of thing you would really need to go out and get that specific education on. Um, and it's a bit above most of the traditional street medic stuff. Um, that's kind of where you're now getting into like uh, more paramedic type training. Um, there are classes you can find out there that will teach you some of this stuff. And there are definitely places online you can learn, but it's something that you're going to need to spend a lot of time learning different pieces of before you get there. And because of that, frankly, I'm not even gonna go into why I pick my why I have my suture kit and what I have in there. Ibuprofen, acetaminophen, Advil, and more advanced options, including injectables, aren't something that you should be carrying until you're comfortable administering them and knowing all of the possible layers of medical information tied to it. It's really important to note that at this point, you don't even know what you don't know. And frequently, the use of even basic medication can be counterproductive later on if you are going to end up bringing somebody to a hospital. There's a variety of allergy problems that you need to be thinking about. There's a variety of medical concerns that, frankly, you don't know what you don't know. It's always a good idea to avoid giving drugs you aren't comfortable knowing. <clears throat> if you don't know that person's complete medical history and you don't know all of the things that would possibly be that you would need to check for in that medical history in order to make it useful. There's a wide variety of other options and useful tools to bring with you. A lot of people bring space blankets. 
Now, this isn't just because you're going to get caught in the woods, but it could be just straight up when you get wounded, you lose heat. You have lost heat in a lot of cases, and part of recovery can be throwing a space blanket on you. Some folks will include a form of emergency food or water with their kit. If you have a diabetic in your group, or if you're a diabetic yourself, you might have an insulin shot or glucose tablets as a, an additional feature of your AFAC. If you or somebody you love has uh, a bee allergy or nut or any sort of major allergy, you might have an EpiPen. The larger and more medically diverse the group, the more supplies you should really consider bringing. Thank you all for tuning into this. I really do appreciate it. I don't want you thinking that this replaces a class. Um, this is a good primer, but in reality, if you can, you should go out, take Stop the Bleed courses, uh, get certified as an EMT, do whatever level of medical training you're comfortable with, and maybe feel a little bit more comfortable putting together your own med kit, or at least starting to while you are looking into these classes. I'd like to thank Lagoon Trading Company, and I would remind everybody to head over there and bug them for med kits. I guarantee you they will be able to find you a specific med kit or one that works with your rig or one that works with your life. They are fantastic peoples. As always, like, subscribe, do all of the normal YouTube goodness. I'm over on Patreon. Actually, I want to give a big thank you to these people who are, you know, really helping me keep this channel going. Thank you all for tuning in. That's going to be it for me. Stay dangerous. Keep each other safe, y'all. And remember, moral doesn't mean legal, and Stonewall was a fucking riot. Peace.